going to be covering uh, session four, which is also chapter four in Adam Hamilton's book, The Call. If you did not have a chance to read it, your sins are forgiven. We don't worry about that. Um, what's important is that we have this time together, and we'll be we'll be looking at several key passages together anyway. But uh, thank you for those of you who were able to prep, prepare a little bit. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet or spend much time with yet, my name is Leah Harakovic. I'm lead pastor here at Westminster. It is such a joy to be with you in the journey class. I don't get to be in here very often, um, and I always love it when I do. But I was telling a few people as uh, we were just getting started, I'm a little rusty. Uh, so thank you in advance for any, any uh, technology glitches, but we are recording this session, just so you know. Uh, welcome to those of you who are attending online. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us as well this morning. Um, please do uh, wave your hands or your electronic Zoom hand um, if and when you have questions or want to jump in, because we, we, I don't want to leave you out, but I'm not always turned towards you. So I know the folks here in the room will also help keep me accountable if you see one of our um, friends uh, online jumping in. Well, we are continuing this morning with the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. We're joining him right in the middle of it. Our chapter last week, Called to Suffer, was about the beginning of that journey, spending a whole lot of time in uh, Philippi. And if you remember, that's where uh, Paul and Silas were jailed. Um, any reflections? What insights surfaced in your reflection on last week's focus, called to suffer? Um, some of, of Paul's advice and his, and his example um, of how he uh, handled suffering in his life. Any, any insights that you gleaned or things you were thinking about this, this past week? Just the amount of suffering he went through, they were singing and they were jailed and they were, you know, and they were even asking, why are you so happy? Why isn't your Lord like freed you? Right, right. I mean, yeah. it was amazing, the faith that they had. Mm -hmm. Glad for it. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the amount of suffering that, and that was just the beginning of his journey. He wasn't done. And there was just a little hole there, a pair of lights. Yeah, right, right. And, had to kill him. and yes. he called everyone to stay when the earthquake came. And He had some incredible influence yeah. on the lives of others around him, even in that short time they spent together in the jail cell. Thank you. And we, yeah, we didn't talk too much about that in the sermon last yes, week. Yes, right? yes, that's good. Right, thank you. Uh, yes, the hand over here online. Gail. Um, I, it, it was memorable for me that the... Um, the guard at the prison, he was so afraid he was going to lose his job because he's expecting everybody to leave mm -hmm. when they, you know, when their chains were broken and yet they didn't leave, which was just so awesome. And then of course he believed, the guard believed. That was pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. The incredible transformation in his life and that his life was saved in more than one way, saved physically, saved spiritually. Thank you, Gail. Um, did I see another hand? Nick, was that you? No, no, it wasn't me. Oh, okay, sorry. Any others in, in the did room? He baptize, he did baptize his family. Didn't he? Yes, he baptized the jailer and the whole household of the jailer that night. Right, right. Thank you. Good reminder. Any other thoughts about uh, the last week's themes, the insights that you had? Yes. Just a transformation of the character of Paul and, you know, from where he started and the fact that he was jailed and he was praising God when he didn't even tell them that he was a Roman citizen. Oh, so right. Just, just his character and the transformation is just so beautiful. Yes, the humility that Paul went about, that, that whole experience, yes, and that it didn't come out until the morning that he was a Roman citizen, that he, he was exempt for some of the humiliation that, that he had endured, right? Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's kind of like no matter what happens, keep moving on. Yeah, no matter what happens, keep moving on. Yeah. I had read something the past week or so that said God's will will never take us where God's grace can't protect us. So God's will will never take us where God's grace cannot protect us oh that's that's beautiful yeah that assurance that assurance that god god is with us indeed thank you 
Well, we we could keep going, um, and and it is amazing to me. Paul keeps going as we're talking about this. That uh, after that experience of being, you know, stripped in public, beaten, put in socks, put in jail, um, that he didn't once he gained his freedom again just turn around and say, "Okay, I've done enough. That was a good journey, and now I'm going home." He doesn't. Um, so let's continue as we uh, gather this morning with our opening prayer and invite you to join me as you are led. Loving God, we yearn to encounter you in your word. Make us aware of your presence as we seek to make your story our story. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we're switching gears just a little bit. Not a new journey, but a new part of the story and the focus that Adam Hamilton has for this section, which is the second half of Paul's missionary journey, is called to love. Um, some of you have been already in the worship service. That is the focus of our, of our worship and praise and the word. Um, but we will start with the video from Adam Hamilton on this subject and this part of Paul's journey together. <laughs> What would lead a first century rabbi to travel thousands of miles by sea and by land, to be beaten, imprisoned, and ultimately beheaded for his faith? It was a call, a call to turn the world upside down. This is the story of the Apostle Paul, whose writings continue to shape the lives of one third of the world's population man second only to Jesus in his impact and influence on the Christian faith, and whose witness defines what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. saw Paul, he was leaving Philippi, having been beaten and abused and imprisoned, and then leaving the prison, he went to the town of Thessalonica. He argued with the Jewish people there and the Gentile God-fearers that Jesus was the Messiah, and there were some Jews who believed and many God-fearing Gentiles. And this created both jealousy and, uh, and a concern that this false teacher was leading people astray, in essence, chased him out of town. He went on to Berea. They sought the scriptures and carefully listened to what he was saying. From there, Paul was led down to the town of Athens, where we are today. And in Athens, we're going to explore Paul's ministry here and some of the things that happened during his time of preaching and uh, speaking and ministering in a community that was largely non-Jewish, Gentile, not even familiar with the Jewish scriptures. And so uh, let's explore a bit of Athens. Paul arrives in Athens, and the first place he comes is to the synagogue, the synagogue right behind me. These are the ancient, uh, this is the ruins of the ancient synagogue in the Agora, the public square. And just above it, you see the temple to Hephaestus. And so you've got uh, temples to all of the gods or many of the gods around here. And in Athens, the public square was known as both the, the birthplace of democracy and the center of philosophy. So, so uh, all around you were people who were coming to debate ideas and to share their philosophical ideas. And so Paul begins discussing the gospel in the market square. And after a time, the philosophers say, we wanna hear more of this. And they wanted him to go with them to, uh, to be able to present his ideas at the Areopagus at Mars Hill. Now, if you look around the, the Agora here, you're gonna find a large stoa, a large uh, covered portico. There were also shops there. You'll find uh, more centers of government. You'll find, uh, you'll find temples to various gods around. Now let's go together to the Areopagus where Paul went and reasoned with the Epicureans and the Stoics. Let's go. This is the Areopagus, about 450 feet above the rest of the city of Athens. And from here, you have a panoramic view of the city. You can see the, the Agora just below the hill, and you can see off into the distance. And when Paul was here, Paul would have seen dozens of temples to various gods from this standing point, from this, from this spot on the uh, Areopagus. Now, behind me, you see the Acropolis, and there are, of course, more temples to Poseidon, 
to uh, Athena, the Parthenon, of course, as well as several others. But, uh, but Paul stands up to speak. They say, we want to hear more of these ideas and these gods that you're proclaiming. And as he does this, he looks for a way to connect with them. And he says, I see that in every way you're most religious. In fact, I even saw a temple to an unknown God here in your city. And he says, that which you worship is unknown, I've come to proclaim to you. And then he begins to say these words. Luke records them in the book of Acts, chapter 17, beginning with verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by human hands, and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all people life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation on the earth, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now, Luke tells us only a few believed in Athens, but you know, it only take, took a few. Paul might have left that day feeling a failure, only a handful of people, two that are named in, in Acts, who put their trust in Christ. But in the centuries ahead, millions upon millions of people in the lands of Greece would put their trust in Jesus Christ. You have no idea when you plant a seed with somebody, the impact that could have, even if it's just one person or two people or a handful of people who have heard of Christ because of you, you have no idea the impact they could have. So Paul left feeling a failure, but in the end, God used him and his witness here to change the world in these lands. After a two-day journey from Athens, Paul arrived here at Corinth. Corinth was the capital city or the, the leading city, the center of government for all of what we would call Greece, Achaia. And, uh, and what you see in the distance is the Gulf of Corinth. And this body of water leads out into the Adriatic Sea. What you see here is the Corinthian Canal. Uh, this is a marvel of engineering. It was conceived in the 6th century before Christ, but wasn't actually built until 1880. It was Construction began, it was finished in 1896. It took 13 years to build this. Now, prior to the building of the canal, what happened was ships would, say, would, would land at the Aegean port. They would be pulled off of the water put onto dollies and slaves would transport them 3.7 miles with all their goods on them across land uh, on uh, tracks, which you can still see, and, uh, and then would deposit them back into the Gulf of Corinth. And so Corinth became one of the wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire. Um, it was also known, however, as a place where the sailors would stay for the day while their ships were being ported over by slaves. And so uh, taverns, brothels, temple prostitutes, all of these were a part of Corinth. And for this reason, Corinth itself became known as a not only a wealthy city, but also as an immoral city. And, uh, and Paul came here and he spent a year and a half ministering, starting in the synagogue, preaching the good news there, and then eventually into the marketplaces, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And, um, and we know that he wrote several letters here to Corinth, probably at least four uh, to the people of Corinth. The, the letters demonstrate that there was a concern among the people for um, sexual immorality, uh, questions about the, the meat market and what's appropriate to eat and not to eat. There were major divisions in the church. There was conflict in the church, and so Paul addresses that conflict. And I want us to explore together these ruins of the ancient city of Corinth. Let's go. on the streets of ancient Corinth right now, streets that Paul undoubtedly would have walked on. And I want to share with you a couple of things from here. First of all, in the background, you see Acrocorinth. This Acropolis was much larger than the Acropolis at Athens and much taller too. This Acropolis is nearly 2,000 feet high. And uh, at the top was the great temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. She was also the goddess Venus in, in Rome. And so the goddess of love, she had at her temple, it said, temple prostitutes who were at her service. And they offered their services to those who came and visited, as well as those who lived in the town of Corinth. And for a donation that was made to the goddess, they offered themselves. Now, as we come down these roads, I want to remind you, Paul came for a year and a half. He, he spent time first in the synagogue, ministering with the Jews, the Gentile god fearers, and uh, led some of them to faith in Christ. Once more, was expelled from the synagogue. He ends up in the public square, and there he's preaching and teaching. And he does this daily for a year and a half. And during that period of time, he has a profound impact on the city. <coughs> One of the 
of the most amazing buildings in the archaeological site of ancient Corinth is the 5th century BC Temple to Apollo. It towered over everything else in the city. It was a magnificent temple. Paul could not have missed this. He would have walked past it many times. He would have seen it every day as he was walking through the city. The sacrifices that were offered there, the animals that were sacrificed there, would have been slaughtered and their meat sold in the marketplace. This is something Paul addresses in one of his epistles to the Corinthians. So this was the Marble Street, one of the Marble Streets of Corinth, and uh, back behind me the shops, and uh, up above these shops was the Temple to Apollo, and that left the meat market in a pretty close proximity to that. So the meat market was actually across the street, the rest of the market here, and, uh, and the food that was sacrificed to idols, the animals that were sacrificed to idols were butchered and sold in the meat market. And this is all part of what you read in, in uh, Paul's letters to the Corinthians was questions about meat that was sacrificed to idols. So this is a part of the, um, of the commercial area of the, um, of the city of Corinth. So now I want to take you to the Acropolis, the Acra Corinth, where in Paul's day, the temple to Aphrodite stood. So we're on the last leg of the road going up to the Acra Corinth. And in the background, you can see the Gulf of Corinth. And again, the Acra Corinth above us. Let's take a look. So this is as high up as we're able to go today. And you can see we've still got several hundred more feet before we finally reach the top of the Acropolis. What you can see from here, however, are the ruins of the ancient castles that were built over centuries. Beyond the top of the Acropolis that you can see here is the foundations of the Temple to Aphrodite. And then you can see the gate that we could see down from the city as we looked up, you can see the gate. And that gate then opened up and there was a road that zigzagged across this valley and made its way on down into the town. And uh, you can still see the remnants of that road, the stones that are uh, going across where the road had been paved all the way down into Corinth. In the church at Corinth, the believers were, were uh, in conflict with one another. They had different parties or factions. And uh, some were with Apollos, and said, some said they were followers of Peter, and some Paul. And, and Paul was calling them to lay aside those things that led to conflict, the pride and the arrogance and the, and the disputations over things that ultimately didn't matter. And he reminded them that the primary characteristic of the Christian life was love. Now, many of you are gonna be watching this video during an election year. Every two years in the United States, we go through this picking at the scab that divides our country, the, the wounds in our country. And, and we're divided, Republican and Democrat, we're divided over, over issues in so many ways. And during that time, we forget we're bound together by Jesus Christ, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we allow this to tear us apart. And we as Christians ought to be that bridge that brings people together, that reminds people by our actions, that demonstrates to people how you live with your differences and yet still love. I wanna invite you to do that in your church and in your community. And so I wanna end by reminding you at this place where the goddess of love was, was uh, worshiped, how Paul defined love and how he challenged us to love. And this is what he said in that famous chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Listen to these words. He said, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then he describes what that love looks like. And he says this, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This kind of love never fails. And then he ends the chapter in this way. And now these three remain, 
faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. in our in our journey with Paul today um, just to orient you this is where we we left Paul last week in Philippi and he went on passing through a couple of notable towns um, Amphipolis Amph Amphipolis Apollonia and then Thessalonica Berea Athens Corinth so these four uh, Thessalonica to Corinth are what we will focus on today. Um, so this is a this is a quote from Acts 17. I wonder if someone would be willing to read out loud for us um, this particular passage. I have a volunteer? Yes, thank you. Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Some of them were persuaded and enjoyed Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women. Thank you. And I should have said at the top, this was in Thessalonica. So this first stop on, on, our, on our way today. Um, so this is the Messiah, Jesus, who I'm proclaiming to you. Some of them persuaded, great many of the devout Greeks, so two different groups there, and not a few of the leading women. Um, but we know that that's not the full story, that there was opposition to in Thessalonica and continuing um, to follow Paul in Berea. What form of opposition did Paul face? Do you remember what kind of opposition? What, what were people upset about in Thessalonica? Yes, yes, Nick. Yeah, I mean, there's the point that's made in this chapter that mm. he um, had a problem with, with Jews, um, with, with his own people, and that they really didn't want to believe this because it really did throw everything that they believed on its face. And he was very firm in his beliefs that Jesus was the Messiah. And it was a Messiah that was very different than the Jews had thought he would be. And as a result, he says, I'm going to go and preach to the Gentiles because, you know, some of this is falling on deaf ears among my own people, my own people. Right, right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Yeah, so so his own people, those who shared his uh, same faith, the Jewish faith, um, but yet they were not opening the, their, their arms to this uh, scholar from afar. Yes, what else? I was going to say, um, also, oh, the, the, those, those who uh, worship the Greek gods. Right. Also. Yes, yeah, so some opposition from those who were of other faiths and those who observed, um, yes, the, the Greek uh, faith system and had their, their own, you know, gods of choice at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Others, yes. Uh, I think the, you know, when he was preaching a suffering that uh, Jesus and then it was necessary that the Messiah would suffer and be raised. This right. is immensely difficult to accept. Yes. By anybody. By anybody. Correct. Right. The, and that was yes. that was offensive. And then, of course, for Jewish people, as they dealt with Christians, mm -hmm. as they separated, it was they. You know, how can we have two gods? Because there's only one God we're to love. So it was a developed. It was a the vision right within the center of faith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, uh, 
if you weren't listening to Paul closely, you might think that he was preaching about another God, a different God, um, especially if you weren't familiar with the theology of, of a Messiah arrival uh, within, within the Jewish faith. Great. And that that Messiah would suffer and be put to death, right? That, that is just not, not part of the traditional understood trajectory of a Messiah, of a Savior. Thank you. Well, let's look at this next question. Those opposing Paul and his colleagues accused him of turning the world upside down. Have you heard that phrase before? Comes from the Bible here. Yeah, isn't that neat? Um, yeah, turning the world upside down. Do you think that accusation could still be made of believers today, those who follow Christ today? What do you think? Any, any thoughts come to mind that you'd like to share? Yes, May. Sometimes yes, and sometimes not. And I okay. think we find it disturbing sometimes because I think that Jesus did turn the world upside down. And we should sometimes still be doing it. And I think when we see when the church has collaborates with repressive regimes, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. it's not turning upside down and, uh, and that bothers us. Yes, yes, right. Yeah, that Jesus did come and turn a lot upside down. And yet the church has sometimes been aligned with, right, those systems that continue to reinforce secular governments and, and other systems of oppression, perhaps. Others, yes. Now, uh, Martin Luther King was accused similarly, and um, even by other Christian, the Christian church, mm -hmm. uh, who hated him, some parts of the Christian church. Uh, he opposed the war. He mm -hmm. was hated for that. Mm -hmm. not be Vietnam War. Yes, thank you. Right, so some Christians even in the 20th mm -hmm. century have had that same accusation of, of, of turning the world upside down by others in the same faith. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? That feels like a kind of modern phrase because we have heard it so recently. Um, I mean, yeah. I, don't th I don't think you can underestimate how much of a radical Jesus was. I mm. mean, just the phrase, the meek shall inherit the earth. I mean, that flew in the face of everything. It wasn't the rich. It wasn't the educated. It's not the powerful. It's the meek that shall inherit the earth. I mean, Jesus's teachings were so profound and different with their times that they didn't know what to do with it, really. Right, and, and clearly some were very threatened by it. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Oh. Other thoughts? What is the excerpt in the study book from the first letter to the Thessalonians? If you have your book with you, it's on page 127. One twenty-seven. What does this excerpt tell you, perhaps, about Paul's ministry in Thessalonica? It starts with our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So here we have a letter from Paul going back to the church in Thessalonica. So what can you, what can you deduce from this part of his letter back to them at a later date? What kind of relationship did he have? He loved them. Oh, yes. He loved them. Right. It sort of um, reminds me of Chris's sermon today, mm. where he, with the kids, he used us, and then he pointed to the congregation, the they's, trying to say that God loved all of us, not, not just little kids, not just a select few, but he loved all. And that's the way that um, excerpt ends and I, I think it's telling and profound absolutely thank you gail yes we love each one of you each one of you so personal 
and, and far encompassing. Thank you. What else? I just I think it's, it's such a parental kind of relationship because in knowing how they had believed and accepted, he also knew that it was opening them up to persecution too. So there was that sense of pride and, and joy in what they had were believing, but also a concern for what they might face because of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for bringing that out. Yes, that, that parent, I mean, in the best sense of the word, he felt all those parental feelings for them. Yes. I love that the baptism was today, too, because the baptism is so specific to each one of us and how um, you ask, okay, do you see your reflection? Yes. You know, that's, that's it. Absolutely. Right. That was such a spirit-led melding today of the waters of baptism and, and that boy that we, at one point, if you weren't in there, we weren't sure if he was going to stay up to get baptized. <laughs> you get to be two and a half, you have your own mind about this, <laughs> even if you can't articulate it. But, but you said friends. Yes. Yeah. Immediately, he waved at all of us. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. We see each other through through those waters as as friends in Christ, as as brothers and sisters, siblings. Yeah, that was really neat. Um, thank you. So we have that beautiful language of of love in so many different facets of that. You know, parental fear and love and pride and you know wanting to protect them, but also knowing that you know they that he's giving them a message that puts them at risk. No. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. Leah, if I could just yes, uh, one, one of the things that beyond uh, in the second chapter of First Thessalonians there, Paul points out that also that the people in Thessalonica had suffered. Um, and, you know, this was because you also suffered the same things from your own people as they did from the Jews. So part of being a I think a healthy church, I mean, Paul mm. certainly had great affection for these people, was that they had been willing to suffer and they had actually experienced suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that most of us in North America have never experienced. Um, you know, so maybe we were not turning the world upside down. Ah, thank you. So, so some. Healthy self-examination there, Ernie. Uh, you're encouraging us to do as those who maybe have not experienced that direct suffering because of our faith. Thank you. What do these travels so far, and we can keep thinking about this question, what do they indicate about Paul's hopes for the church? What are some of Paul's hopes for the church? What do you glean from what you're hearing so far. Yes. Inclusive. Inclusive, yes. Women in particular. Whoa, yeah. Did you notice a couple of these passages, and including a few notable women? Yeah. <laughs> Whoever was writing it down, where you know, we believe it is Luke, the same one who wrote the gospel of Luke was very intentional about saying, including women. There were men and women here um, who were becoming part of this church. Thank you. What else? What what other hopes do you see through these journeys of Paul? I think that he certainly was not naive and knew that what he wanted people to believe and what he wanted the church to be needed constant tending. Ah, what the church needed to be needed constant tending yes he wasn't kind of one and done in these communities these letters that he writes back to them i don't know if you, that's what you, was on your mind but i'm thinking about that too yes that, that his message continued his relationship continued with them almost to the point where he, he's creating a structure because when he leaves he leaves people there Mm -hmm. that believe the same as he does to tend to the flock, so to speak, and to make sure they don't forget and stray. 
So in a, in, a, in a way, he's setting up a structure and a process for it to become a whole church and to reach everybody in the, the whole community. Nick, that's great. Great point. He is leaving leadership in his wake. Yeah, so he is not amassing disciples for himself, um, but he is really empowering people locally to continue. Thank you. Great insight. Yes. And just, I don't know if this is great insight, but as I was reading and it said, Paul went in, I forget, I don't know if it was Corinth or, or I don't know exactly where it was, but I did read this, that he went into the temple on the Sabbath and began to preach. And I just sort of wondered in our well-orchestrated services on Sunday, would we welcome people coming in to preach like that? Just made me think. Oh, I love it. That is, that is a great thought, Gail. There's a seed plant. I have to sit with that for a little while. <laughs> Uh, I think you're being modest about your great insight. There. Uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, one other comment? Yeah. Yes. I'm wondering how much has changed since the days of Paul. Uh, because if you preach inclusion today, loving your enemies, loving the Russians, loving the Iraqis when we were bombing them, mm -hmm. loving the Vietnamese during when I was young, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Even if they're of, are of another religion or have no religion. Right. That Christ it's, and Paul didn't discriminate. It's a very good, bold point. Thank you very much for, for bringing that up. The others kind of are changing. Who who looks like the enemy? Yeah, I think what, you, yeah, what well. was on the front of the bulletin this morning is very thought provoking. Yes. <laughs> Uh, some of you haven't had a chance to get the bulletin yet, but I'll, this is what Bill's referring to. It's uh, from the Brothers Karamontov, uh, Dostoevsky. I've never been able to understand how it was possible to love one's neighbors. And I mean precisely one's neighbors, because I can conceive of the possibility of loving those far away. If I must love my fellow man, he had better hide himself. For no sooner do I see his face than there's an end to my love for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I think one of the things that, that has struck me in the last few years is that uh, what Paul established was a self governing group of people, uh, which was formed along the line of the synagogue, which was shaped in Babylon. Mm. This kind of institution didn't exist mm. in any place until the people of God established it. Their money established it. And that's what came out of the Puritan movement in all of its different forms, again, was self-governing people where the people themselves shaped and, and moved forward. I think that's amazing how Paul did that. It's under the surface of it, but you don't see how he did it. Yes, yes, that's right. It's incredible. It really is. We don't, and we only hear touches, but a lot of people are named, given names, Priscilla and Aquila, and we, we still have their names today of those who continue to, to lead in the church. Thank you. Yeah, and that is a new, a new way, right? Paul didn't, didn't try to maintain this, um, you know, bishop-like control over them. And it comes back again and again over these last 2,000 years. It gets, the church gets established. It becomes a part of the empire. Huh. Uh, and then all of a sudden, there are people again who are self-governing and are a community. Yes. And then you have to deal with how do we, how do we live together? Right, right, right. What is that balance between a formal connectional structure and freedom and autonomy? within that self-governance, yeah. Oh yes, Dick. Uh, just one final point about this, about the uh, about the importance of women. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it, it's, it's an extremely radical notion at the time that women should be important and equal to men because in Orthodox Judaism, women are treated very much as second-class citizens. In Orthodox Judaism, in many synagogues today, they're still on a different floor. They're separated by curtains and buses. 
um, women had a much different kind of role in Judaism. And when Jesus proclaims the importance of Mary and Lydia and all these other people, he's basically saying women are brought into this as well. Mm -hmm. And this had to upset a lot of the Orthodox Jews at the time. And so again, he's going against the grain. He's saying something that's totally radical and new that they can't tolerate in a lot of ways, which is the reason why they're <laughs> being inclusive. Mm. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, and we had the story from last week about uh, Lydia, a, a brand new believer that Paul baptized, and she compelled him and his companions to stay in her household for a number of days, right? So accepting that invitation alone, um, extending baptism to her household, not checking with any men in the household. Yeah, absolutely radical, right? And she became a leader in the church. Um, we're we're going to move on in into Athenian territory. Um, so many of the beautiful shots from Adam Hamilton's video took place in, in modern Athens now. And uh, how many of you have been to Athens? So some of you have, yeah. Any quick um, impressions of what Athens looks like today? Well, they're big. big, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any others? The great ancient ruins, but also very modern graffiti everywhere, okay. vehicles rushing yeah. all around, so real contrast. Yeah, yeah, so it's not just a museum, it's also a very modern uh, yeah, city with, with all that goes with that, right? Yeah, not all, but yeah. <laughs> Where Paul preached, I was up on that hill, and it's very slippery. Very slippery. <laughs> <laughs> walking up, those, those the, the stones are worn absolutely smooth from all those years of people walking up. And when you get to the top, that's where he preached and that's where they gathered. It's very rough. There's no construction. They were sitting on the actual stones. Just getting on a big rock. <laughs> and then you looked out and you knew that 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago, the hills were covered with trees and they had thunderstorms in the summer but they cut all the trees. And you could see that. You could just see the place today and then. Yes, yes. So some things have stayed the same and other things radically different. Right, right. But that was that was the best way to give a big speech that the most people would hear, right? It was practical as well, going up on that big rock. But very few people could be up there at the same time. Ah. It, was, it, was, it was not a comfortable place to be. There were just a few sitting places. They must have stood for hours listening to each other. Oh. And that's where the deliberations were made for the city. So it was a political center. Yes, yes. Thank you. Else? Yes. I'm wondering, how did he begin when he goes to Athens or Corinth? How did he gather a crowd? Yes. How, what was the communication? Like? Where did he stay? Who fed him? Right, right. Absolutely. Good questions. I, I asked myself that question, too. How does he start from scratch in each of these towns? You know, go walking in. Who's, who's the first person that he finds? You know, does he? Yeah, so often he goes to the synagogue and maybe finds some some allies or at least people who are open to, to speaking with him, listening. Um, but there's a lot we know. You're right. I think about, you know, he did not have a huge bank. He didn't have a city card where he would go and find an ATM and pay for lodging at each place. Yeah. His, his occupation was a traveling salesman. So he was not sitting in Tarsus making tents. Yeah. He had to sell tents. He had a trade. So imagine yeah. him as an evangelical salesperson. Wow. And they don't Good. sit there waiting for people to come to them. Right. They come to the customer. Yes. Yes. He doesn't have a job. That's right. He's got to approach people. <laughs> Great. Yes. Talk. I think there's a, um, there's a culture within the Athenian community and the Greek community in the South uh -huh. that was open to hearing other ideas yes. and debating them. Yes. So, yeah. He probably went there with purpose, saying, this is a chance for me to mm -hmm. uh, present new ideas. And I, I could imagine people would stand around, well, here's a different guy, and he sounds smart. <laughs> yeah. It's a good way to occupy an afternoon. Right. There's a culture there. Absolutely. They, they want to hear from somebody who's got some, some provocative things to say. Yeah, they're used to debating. It's a culture of rhetoric. 
act um, and and you were perceived as really intelligent if you could engage in this back and forth debate with someone. So yes, thank you. Well, I've got a quote here from Act 17. Would someone be willing to, to stand up and be Paul um, in this speech? And this is kind of long. So if you want to stand up and give the first half and hand it over to a different Paul, you can do that too. Anybody want to stand up and? I, I will. Oh, oh, okay. We've got somebody up online, and then and then we'll we'll hand it over. Yeah, yeah this is slide. Paul. Okay. Oh, I'm not going to stand up. <laughs> uh, okay. One of the things about this passage it it brings up a point I was going to make for your previous question that how skilled Paul was of delivering his min message, his ministry in a non-threatening way. Yeah, that's that's one of the takeaways. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things from one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth and he allotted the same the times of their existence and the boundaries of their places where they would live so that they would search for god and perhaps rope for him and find him though indeed he is not far from each each of one of us you want me to continue sure oh okay all right, Gabrielle. <laughs> for in him, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Oh, thank you. That was a bombshell. Oh, long so absolutely yes what what would be in your mind if you if this is your very first introduction to jesus as lord has he mentioned jesus yet yes no yes yes maybe he hasn't really called him jesus or christ but there's there's this uh, allusion to a man right so what's your question at this point Having heard this, I would say this guy's crazy. This this is a whack job. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. Okay. Forget about him. Okay. All right. So this is just too far out. This raising from the dead. Okay. Any other reaction? He tops it off by saying he was raised from the dead. Yes. Yes. And I knew. Right. By raising him from the dead. Talk about a cliffhanger. What's next? Do you want to know more? <laughs> So he starts it off, though, with talking about the things that they have in common. Yes. He knows what their beliefs are, their, he, their statues and things. And, and then he says, you know, you have this uh, worship to the unknown God. And then he talks about one of their poets. So it's like he's creating this. They, I'm sure they were listening comfortably at that point right. to what he started to say. Yes. Then he moves into how what he sees is very different from what they've come to believe. So it's like he's an into it. Yes. He sets the, the tone of let's see what we have in common first. Mm -hmm. That's a good starting place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you've anticipated my next question. So what approach did Paul take <laughs> as he preached to the Athenians? Yeah, so he found some common ground. Why would he want to do that? Keep them listening. Yes. So they buy into it. So they buy into it. He establishes a relationship. He establishes a relationship. Yes. What else? 
he sort of brings the people to his level. So he's not, he's speaking with them, not at them. Right. He's speaking with them, not at them. I like, yeah. Thank you, Bill. Yes. The commonalities between what the Jews believed and what the Greeks that he was preaching to. What are those? I mean, just drew everybody in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. But he's showing respect because he shows that he has bothered yes. to learn about them before he opens his mouth. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So he says, as I was walking around, I mean, he was even reading all the inscriptions. I mean, you think about someone who takes the time to do that in your city, uh, who bothers to read all the historical markers and uh, who has done the artwork, how they're dedicated. What about Paul quoting two of their, of their uh, it's not prophets, actually, they're, it's their poets, two poets. Um, it, they were really short quotations. You might have missed those. Oops. Um, the first one is here in this line, for in him we live and move and have our being. I've always loved that Bible passage. Anybody know that that, that was written by a poet in like the fifth century BC? <laughs> Not Paul's original writing. Um, yeah, I've always drawn a lot of comfort from that passage. And then, you know, I've read this a million times and I realized, oh, that was from a, a Greek poet. And as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. So two different poets, Adam Hamilton quotes the exact poets that a lot of scholars think those uh, quotes came from. Yes. I think throughout, especially in Greece, he's making an argument and he's asking people to accept, he's giving examples. But well, look, you even have an a, uh, a unknown God, see? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's possible, you know, right? It's an unknown God, no name, right? It's a kind of an inroad there. Yeah, thank you. I think there's another point, Leah, that could be made too. Is that this was fertile ground in Greece because Greece, by their history, you know, with Plato, mm. Plato wrote about Socrates, who was really a gadfly and went around asking lots of disturbing questions mm. that the Greeks were open to listening to debate, mm. to hearing controversial things. And he, as you point out, very smartly knew how to kind of bring them into it, not feel threatened, but also act on the things that they were already used to, which was asking disconcerting questions. Thank you. Asking yes. about the reason of being and so on. Yeah. Great. So they, they liked being pressed. Right, right. Leah? Yes, Carolyn. Yeah, what, what he's actually doing too is taking these folks from a careful listening of the tangible to moving them into the spiritual world. And he's doing it very subtly and very gradually and very thoughtfully. Okay, they're not accustomed to that. They're worshiping tangible gods. They know there's something else out there, but they're not sure what it is. And he's gradually building that argument to take them into the spiritual world of Christ. Carolyn, thank you. Yes, he does move into the very concrete things, his own observations and his observations of their practices. But then, you know, he, he does make this very reasoned argument about the, does the God of all things really need our our offerings. I mean, as if that God needed anything from us. Um, yeah. So, so moving them away from from just the physical world to that spiritual understanding. Thank you, Carolyn. What other thoughts do you have about this speech in Athens before we move into Corinth? <clears throat> territory because he went from in him we live and we move and we have we being and he ends with the resurrection of the dead oh in a speech yeah. that it couldn't have been very long right that's right. right yes yeah the, he covers a whole lot of territory in a in what is a really short speech and i love carolyn's comment about how it moved from tangible to the yes greater spiritual picture right right absolutely well, and my question when he ended would have been, are you that man? 
<laughs> Are you the one who has been resurrected from the dead? I mean, that'd be my question. Am I looking at it? I mean, is that why you're here? Uh, and, and I'm sure Paul would then you know, be very glad to explain more. Yeah, yeah. But it's not him. Um, well, let's go on to Corinth. Um, what do you remember about first century Corinth? You heard, heard some things in Adam Hamilton's video. What comes to your mind now when we're talking about Corinth? Yes, Susan. I have to say what it reminded me of is Las Vegas. Las Vegas! Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's describing Las Vegas. Yeah, do we have a little flashing light? Sin City! Right, okay, so yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds us of other cities we might know. Anything else about Corinth? Similar to Pompeii as well. Okay, oh similar to Pompeii. Now, can you say a little bit more about the parallels you see? Just the way it was set up and the, mm -hmm. they had fast food and they had prostitutes and they had it all. They had it all. And yeah. The stones that you, I, the stones that you walk on mm -hmm. are slippery and there's grooves in the side of the room. Yes, yes. Where? Right. So we've got this this port city. Yeah. Yes, what else? I also thought how terrible it must have been to live there as a woman. How terrible it must have been <laughs> to live there as a woman. Interesting insight. Yeah, that it was probably not the same kind of party for women as for men. Right. Well, and just how diverse the population was and what they were exposed to through these other ships that came through, ah. the whole other section of the world that other areas may not have had any exposure. Right. So the diversity of Corinth, ships coming in from all other ports and lands and languages and people and cultures and, and products. I mean, just a whole, whole lot of, of mixing of all kinds of things people, cultures, languages, religions. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, Jen. I was just thinking of the, their clientele, the sailors, mm -hmm. and how it's not very dissimilar from some of the guys that he dealt with in World War II and stuff, you know, coming into Italy and they're being offered all sorts of things. Into a know? port, right, right. Yeah. yeah, and the sailors would maybe have a little bit of money mm -hmm. to spend, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, is this city when they where they said there were about 50 percent of the population were enslaved yes more than more than yeah so we talk think about women and it was probably even even more in terms of a percentage of the population that did not have much or any control over their lives um in terms of of uh, where they could go and more and i'm wondering about those slaves and the first classes of them and the women too word if they were able to hear it, how, how could that have been for them? How would they have heard and received Paul's word? And we know that many of them did hear it and receive, yeah. I don't think the original apostles thought of Paul him going around and preaching the word, were they were not as obvious? Well, I missed your first word. What was the original? What did the original apostles think of Paul? Oh, oh, woo! That's a great question. I think you could probably write a whole book on that. <laughs> yeah, well, the question was, what did the original, so the, the, the 11, uh, think of Paul, who, who was not part of that inner circle when Jesus was living? What do you make of this, that Paul is doing so much, and he had never had an encounter with, with the, the, the Christ before resurrection? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great question. It's a huge question. It's one that we might continue to revisit. I like that question. I mean, it, we know that that Paul and Peter had some disagreements. Um, we also know that Paul felt felt very strongly that his we should continue to support the church in Jerusalem. So there was an understanding of the connectional nature of the church which the church in jerusalem i mean largely the apostles the original apostles very influential there so yeah. great question though what happened when paul preached and taught in corinth what was the response do you remember the initial 
I, I put this in here because I thought, you know, we see the pictures of the ruins all the time, but this is one artist, just one artist rendering of what Corinth might have looked like <laughs> then. Um, <coughs> just how, how very uh, urban and metropolitan and refined it must have felt to walk in these beautiful streets after walking in dust. Um, so many of them from day to day, getting to these marble roads. Yeah. Well, we have a passage from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. So again, this is not part of the speech that he necessarily gave in person, but the words that he sent back. Um, if you read the book, um, and, and maybe if you missed this, we think that Paul wrote four known letters to the Corinthian Christians. The first one we've lost, it was referenced in what we call 1 Corinthians, which is the number two letter, um, that there was another letter, 2 Corinthians, and then a following letter. Um, I think I've got that right. Or maybe the fourth, the fourth letters are 2 Corinthians. Anyway, so we know there were at least four separate writings to them, but we have two that, we, that we've held on to today. This is from the first that we, that we have today, um, but his second letter really. Um, would someone be willing to read it? Would you? Would you be willing? We got to now. Would you be willing to read these words from First Corinthians If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these, is love. The original uh, Bible text that I remember ago was faith, hope, and charity. And charity, charity means love. And yes. Most people don't realize. That. Right. Caritas of Caritas. Yeah, I like the King James. Yeah. Charity. Right. Which does for us have a, a little bit different understanding. Yeah. Um, Paul devotes more verses to the subject of sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians than in any other letter. What features in Corinthian life might help to explain that? I, I think we've talked about some of that. <laughs> so let's, let's think about the second question then. In what ways do Paul's words about the nature of love that we just heard, and we just heard a little bit, he says other things about love and love in Christ. Um, what do they, in what ways do Paul's words about the nature of love help us today? How do they help today? Well, he's contrasting physical love. Mm -hmm. with all, I mean, I just think of C.S. Lewis's four loves. Yeah. That physical love versus spiritual love, etc. Love of family, love of everybody. But in, in Corinth, there was a lot of physical love going on. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's contrasting that. Yes. Yeah, so contrasting something that, that might have been more surface or physical level of the flesh, he might say. Those would be his words. Um, with a, a, a deeper love, a fuller sense of love. Yeah. I work, I see a lot of people who have had abusive love. Mm -hmm. And to really hear what true love is, because they say, "How do you tell if you that's what you've known?" Yeah. And to give this guideline of this is what this is what feels good, this is what feels right. Look for this. Right. This Wonderful. is what it looks like. Right, right. When, when you're when there are so many different depictions of what love is, and not all of it is, as you say, healthy, can even be abusive. Um, going back to this picture that Paul paints. Yeah. What else? Yeah. The Greeks would have understood this because they had all those plays that they were written 
about love. Oh, yeah. You know, think about their culture. And they like to talk about love. They love to talk about love. Eros and all these different forms of love that they that they would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. So he was he was talking to the crowd that knew it, what he was talking about. I think. Right. Great. Yes. This is a subject they, they like to dwell on. Yeah. They like to build monuments to and personify right. and, and God goddesses. Yeah. The, the, so, right. He was entering into a very, um, uh, yeah, a, 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 yeah, a fraught topic there, but a hot topic too. Yes. So. And if we take this a little bit out of context, as we know the end of the story and much more about it, we substitute God for love. Yeah. You know, God is patient. God is, God is all these things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. God is not envious or boastful. It just mm -hmm. fill out for me sometimes aspects of God. Aspects of God, right? Because elsewhere in Scripture, we understand that God is love. Right. Right. And those who abide in love, abide in God, God abides in them. Yeah. And it gives you the scale by which to look at other things. Cause I was struck this time by things like speaking in tongues of mortals and angels, prophetic powers, understanding mysteries and knowledge. Those are all good things. Yes, those are all good things. They're all good things, but without love being the scale that you measure those things, mm -hmm. love is to be first. They are all hollow. Yeah if love is not behind them absolutely yeah thank you yeah yes oh, oh we've got yes uh susan and nick yeah um i like in the video at towards the end when he said and i think this is a where love can come in when there are differences of opinion mm -hmm. and that there's acceptance of differences can often be better heard when you're in a loving space we have a fair amount of division going on right now where yeah, the absolutely. differences of opinion mm -hmm. and it's causing um, some challenges for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but if we come at it with love and just hearing people, that listening, when he talked about Mr. Ro I love Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. yeah. He talked about Mr. Rogers today and just listening. We need to listen to people and accept what they say. It's their viewpoint. Yes. It doesn't have to be ours. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Good, a good point to reset when, when tensions are really felt, right? Yeah. Reset with love. Something that came because I was in this class today, seeing that picture of how these fully loaded ships were dragged by slaves yeah. from one side to another. Right. And that's what happened as in the cotton industry in this country yeah. in the slavery system yeah. where people were evaluated uh, as to how much they picked and then they got a number of stripes on their back depending on how much they picked mm -hmm. imagine paul's words when he speaks to half the people who are slaves and they knew what happened when somebody owned you mm -hmm. with a gospel that says you're somebody you're free and god made you that way no wonder the women and the uh, and people, many of them heard him gladly, like they did Jesus. Yes, thank you. No wonder many of them heard them gladly. Amen. I'm gonna yeah. 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 take this and turn it oh, around. Oh, okay. we've got. Uh, oh, go ahead, and then Nick. I'm sorry, Nick. I forgot. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna take this and turn the turn around what you said. It just occurred to me. You know, he's here making a big deal because a, a sailor is having cavorting with a prostitute but yet the real crime is that you've got half the population who is being absolutely abused yeah. Yeah. and he's worried about a, a few a few prostitutes <laughs> i mean I, I i now that i didn't think about that till right now that's that's troubling me because you know they they say you know you, you know you, you point out the splinter in somebody's eye and you ignore the what is it the two by four in your eye or whatever and that's what it feels like is happening here that's like the real immorality yeah yeah right thank you and 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 we we have a different letter from Paul addressing someone who has run away from slavery Philemon but you're right. Um, 
I think our ourselves would wish that Paul had perhaps said more and even define more broadly what it is to, to uh, commit crimes against another person who is made in the image of God. Nick. Yeah, I, I think there's a higher level here that also needs to be looked at, which Paul is getting to. I don't think he's quite there yet, but he's basically saying Jesus lives within us. And that makes our body a living temple or a living church. Yep. And we have to be respectful of the fact that he is in us and he's guiding us and he's teaching us all the time. And it makes our bodies have a, a different kind of importance. It's the importance of being a living temple. Thank you. Church. Yes, the richness of his theology, his body theology, and, and the implications for ourselves and how we view ourselves and how we how we view others. Well, that's why that's why he makes the point that you know it would be best if men didn't marry that's because right. they should be dedicated to the Lord and, and learning what the Lord is saying to them. Mm -hmm. And for you know, lots of years this has screwed up the Catholic Church, this this teaching, but you know, his point was your first and foremost rule of life should be to learn about the Lord and Jesus and to serve him. And right. other things come secondary, including marriage. Thank you, Nick. Liam? Yes. Liam? Yes, Carolyn. Yeah, I, I, just to correct one of those statements that was made a little bit a little bit ago. Um, you know, Adam Hamilton quotes Strabo, the Greek philosopher, as saying that the temple was served by a thousand temple prostitutes who descended down into the city and were giving offerings to support the temple. So it wasn't just a few prostitutes, it was a thousand roughly, according to Strabo, and, and he was the Greek philosopher and geographer at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my point being that what Paul was addressing was a very serious issue in Corinth. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes, the the that picture of a thousand is is almost overwhelming um, yeah. to think about. It was overwhelming even for Adam Hamilton to think about whether that number was an exaggeration or not. But what. Whether it was a thousand or a hundred, it, it sounds like uh, you're right. That was pervasive uh, among the culture, and, and I think as as Meg pointed out too, you know, we don't know the conditions of those temple prostitutes and how how much agency they had in that. Um, we're we're kind of getting out on our time. It's noon, and I want to leave you with these closing thoughts. Um, we probably don't have time to to explore each question at length, but um, think about. Uh, this last one, what are you carrying with you as you seek to answer God's call? We think about, uh, you know, Paul and, and his travels. Uh, we, we didn't even talk too much about how much time he spent in Corinth, 18 months. When you think about a journey, you think, okay, I'm going to stop here for three nights. You know, after four or five nights, I've seen it all, ready to move on. He, he pretty much set up shop with Priscilla and Aquila, got a job among them, um, making tents. And, and nurturing them as leaders in the church. Um, and, and also, you know, Paul was a man of his time too. And so what, what might we be continuing to carry, uh, making our journey more difficult or difficult for others uh, in the faith or those who have yet to come to faith? Um, thank you all for your time today, for your commitment to this exploration in Lent of, of Paul and the ways that he points us to Christ's good news. Um, let us join together in, in a closing prayer. Loving God, guide us as we seek to emulate the most profound example of your love in Christ, your son, Jesus Christ. Make us aware of your presence with us, guiding us by your spirit as we continue our journey as followers of the way. In the name of the one who came to show us your love of life, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
may you go in peace in Christ's name. Thank you again for your time this morning. And blessings. Don't forget to look into the next chapter, which is called Called to Give, chapter five. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to those joining online. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.